This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be about Gauss sums. Um, more precisely, we'll be talking about Gauss sums and how to use them to prove the law of quadratic reciprocity, which you remember says PQ times QB is equal to minus 1 to the B minus 1 over 2 times Q minus 1 over 2 for P and Q odd distinct primes, positive primes, that is. Um, so last lecture we gave a, 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 a proof of this. Um, and as I said, there are something like 300 proofs of the quadratic reciprocity law. So we're going to give a second one. You can see a list of many of them in this rather nice book by Lemmermeyer on reci reciprocity laws. So there's the law of quadratic reciprocity in the the pictures are Euler and Eisenstein, I believe. And in the back of the book, he has a list of some of the proofs. So you see here are the first um, six proofs by Gauss. Uh, he, he sort of lists Legendre at the beginning, but Legendre's proof wasn't actually complete. So, so Gauss has the first proof of it. Um, and the list goes on for you know several pages. Um, and it ends in the year 2000. Of course, there have been several proofs since then. Um, so there are a couple of hundred listed here. And in fact, he lists about 300 proofs in another book. Um, so anyway, so we're just going to give a second proof of it. Um, so first of all, we need to um, define what a Gauss sum is. So a Gauss sum, often denoted by the Greek letter tau, is denoted by sum over x mod p of, you take the Legendre symbol and you multiply it by epsilon to the x. And let me explain what epsilon is. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that q is congruent to 1 mod p for simplicity. And um, at the end of the lecture, I'll explain what you do if q is not congruent to 1 mod p. Um, but this means that um, the integers modulo q under multiplication, we remember they're cyclic, of order divisible by p. And this means that it has an element epsilon in z modulo q z star of order exactly p. So you can think of epsilon as being a pth root of 1. So epsilon to the p is congruent to 1 mod q. Um, in fact, since epsilon is not 1, um, we also find that 1 plus epsilon plus epsilon squared plus all the way up to epsilon to the p minus 1 is also congruent to 0. And more generally, 1 plus epsilon to the i plus epsilon to the 2i and so on plus epsilon to the p minus 1i is congruent to 0 for i not congruent to 0 modulo p. So these are the usual properties that sums of roots of unity tend to be zero and, and, and unless the root of unity is one. Um, so that's what the Gauss sum is. Uh, so this is an element of z modulo qz because all of these, this is plus or minus one and this is obviously an element of z modulo qz. Um, Gauss sums are actually very closely related to the gamma function. So if you look at the definition of a gamma function, um, gamma of s is the integrals 0 to infinity of e to the minus t, t to the s minus 1 dt. Um, what you notice is that if you compare the definition of a Gauss sum with the definition of a gamma function, there seems to be no relation between them whatsoever. But if you look more closely, they're actually really rather similar. First of all, um, integration is really a sort of summation. So here we're integrating over the positive reals, and here we're summing over the integers mod p. Well, positive reals are almost a field if you ignore the negative reals, and the integers mod p are also a field. So in both of these, we're sort of summing or integrating over a field. Um, next, um, we have this term epsilon to the x corresponds to e to the minus t. That, that, that's because um, these are the properties that epsilon to the x plus y is equal to epsilon to the x times epsilon to the y, and e to the minus t1 plus t2 is 
equal to e to the minus t1 times e to the minus t2. So, so that expression and that expression are both sort of um, um, exponentials of something. And finally, um, these two terms here um, are also kind of similar because they're both multiplicative. We notice that xyp is equal to xp times yp and um, t to the s um, 1 s2 is equal to t to the s1 times t to the s2. So um, the, 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 the Gaussian sum is actually reasonably similar to the gamma function. Um, and it turns out that any formula you can prove for the gamma function quite often has a sort of analogue for Gauss sums and vice versa. I mean, they're not exactly the same. I mean, obviously, Gauss sums aren't exactly the same as gamma functions, but there's just a very strong formal similarity. Um, anyway, what we're going to do is to, is to um, write down some basic properties of Gauss sums. So the first property is that tau squared is equal to minus 1, p minus 1 over 2 times p. Um, so, um, and the proof of this, we take the formula for tau, which is sum over x mod p of x p times e to the x. And then we, we're going to square it. So, so tau squared is going to be, we have to sum over both x and y of x p um, times y p times, uh, so that should be epsilon, times epsilon to the x um, times epsilon to the y, so that's just epsilon to the x plus y. Um, and we can write this as sum over all x, y, and now we're going to take both of them to be non-zero, since these two terms are both vanish if x or y is zero. And then we, we, we can take x, y, p times um, epsilon to the x plus y. Now we're, we're going to make a change of variable. Um, we're going to write this as sum over x, y, not zero, of x, p. So we're going to just divide x, we're going to multiply x by y, and you notice that x y squared p is the same as x p. And then we get um, epsilon to the x y plus y. And now we can write this as a sum over all x and y of x p times um, epsilon to the x plus 1 times y. And you, you notice the, 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 the sum we can just include x equals zero because this vanishes, and we can include y equals zero because um, the, the, the sum over these things um, vanishes if we sum over y. Um, and um, now we write this as a sum over x times xp, and then we have a sum over y of epsilon to the x plus one y. And this is a sum over powers of a root of unity. So this term here, it's naught if x plus y, 1 is not um, congruent to 0 modulo p. Um, and it's um, a p if x plus 1 is congruent to 0. So the only term here we get is where x is equal to minus 1. So this sum becomes minus 1 choose minus 1p times um, p. And now we notice this is what we're trying to prove because minus 1 to the p minus 1 over 2 is equal to minus 1p. Um, so these are both just plus 1 if p is congruent to 1 mod 4 and minus 1 if p is common to minus 1 mod 4. So this has proved this the first relation for the um, Gauss sum. Um, I said that um, Gauss sums are related to the gamma function. There's an analogous property of the gamma function which says that um, gamma of s times gamma of 1 minus s 
is equal to pi over sine pi s, um, which again doesn't look at all like this relation here. But if you look at the proof of this relation for the gamma function, you find it's very similar to the, the proof of this relation for Gauss sums, except instead of making a change of variable in, in, in a double sum, you have to make it a similar change of variable in a double integral. Um, anyway, um, that's the first property we need for Gaussian sums. The second property is the following. It says that tau to the power of q is equal to q, the Legendre symbol qp times tau. And to this, um, we just take the sum x, sum of x mod p of xp um, times epsilon to the x. So, so this is just tau. And now we're going to raise both sides to the power of q. And we, we notice we're working modulo q because um, um, ep epsilon is, is, is just a number taken mod q. So, so let's raise both sides to the power of q. And now this is going to be sum over x mod p of x over p to the q times epsilon to the qx. And here we're using the fact that a plus b to the q is congruent to a to the q plus b to the q modulo q. So, so if we're working modulo q, then taking qth powers is very easy. And you notice this is just the sum over x mod p of x p, because this, since this is 1 or minus 1, this taking the qth power doesn't make any difference. You remember q is odd. Um, and then we get it silent to the qx. And then we can make the change of variable. Um, um, x goes to x q to the minus 1. Um, and we ha have a sum over x mod p of x q to the minus 1 p times epsilon to the x. And this is just equal to a sum over all x of q to the minus 1 p times x p times epsilon to the x, which you notice is just q to the minus 1 p. Here we're taking q mod p. Um, of tau, which is of course just the same as qp. Uh, again, q, q to the minus 1 means q to the minus 1 taken mod p. It's, it doesn't mean a rational number. Um, so that's what we were trying to prove. So, so again, it's a rather straightforward calculation, making some um, obvious changes of variable and so on. So let's summarize what we've got. We've got tau squared is equal to minus 1 to the p minus 1 over 2 times p, and we have tau to the q is equal to qp times tau. And now, just by manipulating these two, we can easily get the law of quadratic reciprocity. First of all, we take this one here, and we notice that it says tau to the q minus 1 is equal to qp times tau. And now we can write tau to the q minus 1 um, is just tau squared to the q minus 1 over 2. So we substitute in tau squared from this, and we find minus 1 to the p minus 1 over 2 times p, to the power of q minus 1 over 2 is equal to, sorry, that tau shouldn't be there, is equal to qp. Um, and now, this is just the law of quadratic reciprocity because this gives us minus 1 to the p minus 1 over 2 times q minus 1 over 2 times p to the q minus 1 over 2 is equal to qp. And this is all modulo q. But if we're working modulo q, then this term here is just q Legendre symbol qp. So we've got the law of quadratic reciprocity. Um, so, um, again, as I said last lecture, most proofs consist of one key idea followed by a lot of rather routine calculation. In this particular proof, the key idea, which is not obvious, is to write down the definition of a Gauss sum. Once you've written down the definition of a Gauss sum, um, both of these formulas here are rather straightforward routine calculations and um, deducing the law of quadratic reciprocity from them is also fairly straightforward. So as usual, there's a, 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 there's a very short key idea which is rather difficult to think of and followed by a lot of straightforward calculation. 
Um, I'm not sure how Gauss managed to think of Gauss sums. It may have been related to his construction of a 17-sided regular polygon because Gauss sums turn up naturally in that construction. So maybe that's what gave him the idea. Um, anyway, you remember there was one slight problem we had earlier that we said Q is congruent to 1 modulo P um, because we needed that in order to find an element um, epsilon such that epsilon to the P is congruent to 1 and epsilon is not congruent to 1. So we can ask, what if Q is not congruent to 1 modulo P? Well, what we have to do then is we change the field Z modulo QZ to a bigger field um, containing some epsilon with epsilon to the P is congruent to 1. Um, and the way we do this is, is, is by using some of the ideas from abstract algebra we mentioned earlier. What we do is we take the polynomial x to the p minus 1, except we don't want the root 1, so let's divide it out. And then we write this as x to the um, x to the 0 plus x to the 1 plus and so on plus x to the p minus 1. And what we do is we take an irreducible factor of this polynomial, let's call it f of x, and what we do is we take the field of integers modulo q and we adjoin a variable x and we quotient out by f of x. And this is now a field and the order is equal to q to the power of the degree of f of x. So if, if, if q is 1 mod p then, then, then this has an irreducible factor of degree 1 and this field is just equal to z modulo qz, but in general it might be slightly bigger, and it contains an element epsilon with epsilon to the p congruent to 1, and epsilon is not congruent to 1. So it has a primitive piece root of unity, which is just the image of x. And now we can just repeat the proof we gave, except instead of using the integers modulo q, we use the integers modulo q with, with this extra piece root of unity adjoined. So that, that gives a proof of the law of quadratic reciprocity that works for all odd primes P and Q. Okay, next lecture I'll be talking about a, a, um, an extension of the Legendre symbol called the Jacobi symbol.